Today we shall consider another aspect of embedded system design that is the dependability aspect. Dependability is that property of an embedded system such that reliance can justifiably be placed on the service it delivers. Now, what does that really mean? It means that when you are deploying embedded system for various practical applications, we got to have some kind of a confidence about the functioning of the system. We might have designed a very sophisticated system, but the system fails regularly then that system is violating the dependability characteristics. In fact, today when this kind of embedded systems or computer as components is being used in a variety of scenarios and these computers are also getting connected via network, under these circumstances dependability is turning out to be a critical issue. Because we need to work in a fail safe fashion as well as we need to protect our system against malicious attacks. So, this aspect of the design with relation to embedded systems is what we shall explore today. We obviously shall not have time to go into details of the techniques, we shall basically have an exposure to different aspects of dependable design. There are various facets of dependability. In fact, the points that I have indicated here, reliability, availability, safety, security, maintainability, all of these contribute towards dependability of an embedded system. A system is reliable if it continues to provide correct service. Availability is the system is ready to provide you with a service when you are asking for it. If you consider a kind of a network attack, an intrusion onto a system such that the system gets clogged and when you are asking for a service, the server is not being able to provide the service then what we have is actually a denial of service attack and that is an example where availability of a system can go down because of a loophole in the system as such. Safety refers to another aspect of dependability because you would like the embedded system to work such that even if it fails there are no catastrophic consequences, even if there are wrong inputs there are no catastrophic consequences. Related to this is security. In fact, the example of availability that I had given you is the reason for the system becoming non-available was a security breach. So, security is related to methods and techniques being built into the embedded system to prevent unauthorized access. This is related to what is called integrity of the system as well as confidentiality of the data that is being stored as well as the data being transmitted from the system. The next issue is that of maintainability, whether the system can be repaired, whether the software or the hardware can be upgraded on demand, that also is an important issue for the purpose of dependability. Because if the system fails and if cannot be repaired easily, then the availability of the system goes down because a system may fail and if it has a mechanism to take care of the fault and restart its function within a short interval, then the system can remain available at a regular basis. So, availability of the system is much better when the system is maintainable. So, all these facets together defines dependability of a system. But depending on applications, these factors can play different role. So, that is why we say the customers must identify the dependability requirements of their system 
and developers must design so as to achieve them. So, because you could, should realize that the moment I am going for dependable design, I might need to do something extra. I might need to put extra hardware, I might need to modify my software. All this extra leads to cost. So, whether the customer would bother for that additional dependability feature or not is a key issue in designing for dependability. And depending on the appliance and the requirements, different factors can be associated with different significance. What is reliability? Reliability means that the level and frequency of failure is acceptable. That means we are assuming that there may be failures. So, we are not requiring that there are no failures at all, okay? because any practical system cannot work really without failures. What we are asking for is an acceptable level of the failures and the failures are needed to be measured in a pragmatic fashion. So, we should now understand therefore, difference between failures and faults. A failure corresponds to unexpected runtime behavior observed by a user. A fault on the other hand is a static characteristic which causes a failure to occur. But it is also true faults need not necessarily cause failures. Faults will cause failures only if the faulty part is used. This is true for software as well as for the hardware. Because there may be a bug in a software, but that part of the software is being rarely used. If, if that part is being rarely used, then that failure would rarely occur. So, although that bug or the fault remains in the software, the system still can be reliable because that part of the software is being rarely used. Because we have to accept one reality that we cannot eliminate failures. Failures can happen because of certain transient phenomena. In fact, one example we had talked about earlier that there may be hot spots in an SOC or uh, and those hot spots may be really failure prone. So, over a number of years of operation, there can be faults, transient faults coming in, failure of the components. So, a f that failure is not really because of a fault. That failure has come in because some component has actually failed. Okay? Now, the question is if I really use a reliable component, that means the probability of failure of that component is very low, then my system would be reliable. Same thing is true for the software, there may be bugs, bugs cannot appear uh, suddenly in a transient fashion, bugs will be there in the software because uh, bugs were there when the software is designed itself. And the testing process cannot always unearth all possible bugs. Okay? And if bugs remain in a rarely used part of the software, then that fall, bug or the fault can lead to failure only when that part of the software is being used. And the other question is user may not always notice a failure, because user does not know the specification of the system. There may be a failure because of non-compliance with the specification of the system. But if grossly the functional requirements are being met, the user may not be able to detect the failure, because user does not know the specification. So, if the user does not detect a failure, in that case, those failures can go completely unnoticed. Then let us look at the relationship between correctness and reliability. A system can be correct, but unreliable. Now, this can result from incorrect specification. How can it come? Because when I am providing the specification, my specification can be incomplete in the sense that it provides the functional requirements for the normal operational scenario. There may be some exceptions and those exceptions might not have been covered by the specification. Therefore, when I write my software or design my hardware, I have taken care of the basic requirement and the system is correct with respect to the basic requirement. 
but the system has not taken care of some of the exceptional situations. And when those exceptional situation arise, the system fail. Okay? So, the system actually satisfies a specification, the system is correct. But since the system fail under exceptional conditions and those exceptional conditions are not rare, that is why the system can be unreliable. The system can be reliable, but incorrect. So, it is an example of a software can result from a program that does not exactly meet its specification, but which works well, well enough. That means, it does not really have a bug, but it does not satisfy the functional requirements completely. So, in that case, the system can be reliable, but not correct. So, in fact, what we are looking for is a correct as well as a reliable system. So, reliability in a way is a main concern and correctness is a means to this end. Why? Because the moment I can provide a proper specification and if I write my software or if I design my hardware meeting completely the specification, I am getting the correct system. If I have got the correct system, if my specification is complete enough, then I have the ability to take care of exceptional situations which would increase the reliability of the system. But we have to keep in mind that whatever exhaustive testing I do, there is a limitation in time. I cannot possibly take care of all possible combinations to provide that as a test data to the system to verify whether it works properly under all possible inputs. So, there may be bugs there already in the system. Okay. So, my basic point is that I may design a system meeting the specifications. If my specification is complete, it will take care of most of the exceptional conditions as well as basic functional requirements, but there may be failures because of some faults which goes undetected. There may be failures because of some transient phenomena leading to failure of components. And we have to look at measures to increase the reliability of the system by taking care of these possible failure scenarios. Then the question comes of reliability and efficiency. As reliability increases, system efficiency tends to decrease because to make system more reliable, redundant code must be included to carry out say runtime checks. This is an example. So, I may like to do a runtime memory check to make sure that some bit in the memory has not got arbitrarily flipped and producing an error. So, if I can find that there is an error, I can flag that condition early. So, these kind of check codes can tend to slow down the system. In fact, this would lead to more memory requirement as well. Okay. So, reliability and efficiently may be at cross purposes. So, that is why the issue comes in, if I really want reliable system, then to take care of the efficiency, I might need to use additional processing capability. In fact, the basic philosophy wise, we say reliability is usually more important than efficiency provided I meet the constraints. When we are looking at the design, we start with functional specification as well as non-functional specifications. Non-functional specification would specify the constraints. So, I might like to have a design which satisfy those constraints and at the same time reliable, maybe sacrificing efficiency to a certain extent. So, we say that no need to utilize hardware to fullest extent as processors are cheap and fast. Unreliable software should not be used and it is difficult to improve an unreliable systems and software failure costs often far exceed system costs. In fact, and costs of data loss are very high. In fact, if you see the factor which in many cases lead to failures are actually software failures. Hardware failures uh, are there, but uh, software failures are more critical. Why? Because in many cases, you are using 
or reusing a hardware component. So that means hardware component has gone through a various process of testing and validation. And you are developing a software which is your application or appliance specific. Okay? So that software, although we might be using some of the components designed earlier, but that software as a whole might not have been exhaustively tested. And the second point which comes in is that you are actually running the hardware under that software control. The hardware itself may be reliable, but under the software control, it may lead to some kind of failures. Okay? So software failure becomes a very critical component. And we would not like to obviously have a data loss because cost of data loss is high. What are the failure consequences? Reliability measurements do not take the consequences of failure into account. Okay? That is, we take care of the fact that there would be failure, but what would be the consequence of the failure, that is not taken into account. That means, if there is a failure of an fly-by-wire system in an aircraft, the cost of the failure is loss of human lives. But a reliability measure strictly does not take care of that cost or consequences of failure. In fact, transient faults may have no real consequences, but other faults may cause data loss or corruption and loss of system service. So, what is the cost of these lost is not really part of the reliability. So, therefore, in order to take care of the cost, you can understand we have to talk about a different measure. And it is necessary to identify different failure classes and use different measurements for each of these if we are talking about the reliability measures. So what are the requirements for reliability? If a failure has high cost, then reliability becomes important. How important depends on the cost. And most software is typically not very reliable because the prop point I am telling that software are basically developed in an application specific fashion and they are not really reliable. And so the point is, if I am really designing for reliability, if I know what is the cost of a failure, I would like to eliminate or minimize those failures for which the cost would be really high. So in fact, the reliability in a way cannot be always defined objectively because it varies from perception of perception because perception can change the cost of the failure and requires operational profile for its definition. Why? The operational profile defines the expected pattern of software or hardware use. And from that expected pattern of hardware and software use, you can actually figure out whether these faults would occur, what is the probability of those failures to occur, and what would be the cost of those failures, because that also depends on the usage pattern. So for example, I am taking a software example, I might have written a, a word processor which has got a thesaurus service and there is a bug in a thesaurus service and you say that the thesaurus is being really used. If thesaurus is being really used, how do I know that? I, I know that only from the operational profile of the software. Okay? So the thesaurus bug would have less probability of occurrence and if I want to have a release of a software with a deadline, I might like to have go for the first release with that bug not being removed. The system is faulty, true, but you can have reasonable reliability of the system because thesaurus will be rarely used. And we would also consider fault consequences. If thesaurus suggests a wrong word, at least the user may use his knowledge and correct it. So the consequences may not be critical. So not all faults are equally serious. System is perceived as more unreliable if there are more serious faults. Now you can understand this whole entire discussion is based on the fact and the assumptions that there would be faults and there would be failures. The question is what best we can do after accepting this reality. So what are the reliability metrics? First is probability of failure on demand. This is a measure of the likelihood the system will fail when the service request is made. Okay? So we indicate this as POFOD, probability of failure on demand. So if I say that this has got value 0 0.001, means that 
one out of 1000 service requests result in failure. Okay. It is relevant for safety critical or non-stop systems, that systems which are always working and, they are, and it is processing a service request continuously, then this becomes important because you are requesting for the service and if there is a failure, that means the service is being denied to you. Next thing is rate of fault occurrence. This is the frequency of occurrence of unexpected behavior. What is the difference between the two? In this case, it is a failure when you are demanding a service. Say for example, I am asking for a cash to be delivered through my ATM machine okay? and the system fails to deliver the cash. Right? That is the failure on demand and there would be a measure indicating that. And what is the rate of fault occurrence? That is frequency of occurrence of unexpected behavior. You go to an ATM machine and you find that it is not working for some reason. It is not that you have demanded a service of cash that is cash being delivered to you, but it is not working. So, it is a random fault which has taken place, an unexpected behavior. So, it means that in this case 0 0.02 means that two failures are likely in each 100 operational time units. So, this measure is coming over the period of time for which the system is in operation. Here it is measured in terms of number of times that the service is being requested. And so rate of fault occurrence would be relevant for say operating system, transaction processing systems and various other things as well. Okay? So these are two basic reliability metrics. Then how do you measure this? Measure the number of system failures for a given number of system inputs. Okay? So, this is used to compute this failure on demand. Measure the time or number of transactions between system failures and this is used to compute the rate of fault occurrence as well as mean time to failure. Okay? And measure the time to restart after the failure. In fact, this will lead to another measure which is called availability and which is linked to another aspect of your dependable design. So, what is the basic difference in this case? So, if we give a number of system inputs, that means when we are asking for service, we are giving system inputs. Given the system input, whether the system is able to provide the service, that is exactly used to measure this. And here you measure the time between the system failures. System has failed today and I have observed the next failure after 3 days. Then what is the time between the system failures? Okay? And that is used for measuring these parameters. Now obviously these measurements if are to be obtained, this has to be obtained at a validation or a testing phase as well as these informations are provided from field data. That is once you have deployed the system from the field data, you get this information. Once you get this information, then you may think of improving the design at a later version so that you get a better reliability. There can be various time units which are used in reliability measurements. So, and we say that time units have to be carefully selected. It can be raw executions time for non-stop systems. It can be calendar time for systems which have a regular usage pattern, example systems which are always run once per day. The number of transactions for systems which are used on demand. So, all these could be used as measure of time because time becomes a critical parameter to use for computing reliability of a system. So, formally how do we define reliability? Probability that the system will operate correctly in a specified operating environment up until time t. So, this is what is your reliability t. Okay? So, what it says? Probability that the system will operate correctly in a specified operating environment up until time t. Okay? So, system is up working properly up till time t. What is the probability of that? 
So, if I have measurements available from at different installations, if I am using the field data, using that installation data, I can make an assessment of the reliability. If I have put to validation testing a number of these systems that I have designed, from there also I can compute this probability. And this probability would be more in terms of relative frequency interpretation of probability and not really subjective interpretation of probability. And what is the mean time to failure? It will be the expected value of reliability measure that we have already defined. So, it is an expected value of this probability. Okay. In fact, it is important to note T. Okay. So, what we say that if a system only needs to operate for 10 hours at a time, then that is the reliability target. We would like to see what is the probability the system will not fail if we keep the system running at a stretch for 10 hours. Okay. So, the T now becomes 10 because it is no point trying to work it out for 365 days because after running for 10 hours system will be put to off and again booted up and expected to run continuously for 10 hours. Related to this is the concept of what is called recoverability. Probability that the system will operate correctly at time t after a failure. Okay. Please try to distinguish between the reliability t and recoverability t. Recoverability is probability the system will operate correctly at time t after a failure. Okay. And these can be used to compute what is called mean time to repair. And the mean time to repair is expected value of this recoverability. Okay. That means, there is a failure and after the failure you can repair the system and, and it will operate correctly. Okay. So, obviously, if a system is not maintainable, then you cannot have good recoverability measure. Obviously, since we are talking about recoverability, we come to what is called availability. Availability is a probability the system will be operational at time t. Please try to distinguish between recoverability and availability. In recoverability, we are telling that probability that the system will work correctly after a failure at time t. And availability is probability the system will be operational at time t. And in fact, you can contrast this with the concept of reliability t also. Reliability is, reliability t is what? The probability that the system works correctly for time t. This is what we are telling probability that the system will be operational at time t irrespective of what has happened in the past. This is something very, very important. The distinction between reliability, recoverability and availability. So, the expected value of uh, availability is given by this mean time to failure divided by mean time to failure plus the mean time to repair. Literally, therefore, availability indicates the readiness for service. Okay? That is only applies when you ask for a service and it admits the possibility of brief outages, obviously, because you are accommodating for mean time to repair. And you can understand this is fundamentally different concept than that of a reliability. What reliability is telling? Reliability tells you that whether the system will work in a proper fashion for time t without a failure. Here what we are looking at whether the system is available, that the system is operational at time t, whatever has happened in the past. Okay? And that is how these parameters are defined. So, let us take an example. A system that fails on average once per hour, but which restarts automatically in 10 milliseconds is not very reliable, but is highly available. Okay? It can restart if there are a restartable system and for restart it takes just 10 milliseconds. Then if I randomly try to find out whether the system is available or not, I shall figure out that system is really available. But why this reliability is low? because it is failing once per hour. So, availability and reliability are not same. 
and depending on apl application you would like to have maybe availability or reliability or maybe both. So, the design trade off is if we look at availability. So, MTTF by MTTF plus MTTR and the question is how to make availability approach 100 percent. So, there are two options. So, if I have mean time to failure okay, approach infinity, my availability will be high. Okay. And uh, if we have mean time to re repair going down to 0, then also the availability will be high. So, in this case when it, it, it reduces, we accept the fact that there will be failures or outages, but from outages system will recover very fast and that is why the availability will be high. On the other hand, we are designing a system to be in such a way that the failure probabilities are very low. Okay. Obviously, related to this is a concept of maintainability, the ability of the system to undergo repairs and modifications. So, if it is a maintainable, then you can realize that availability will also increase because that means after a failure, the system can be repaired very fast. So, we have got the concept of maintenance, evolution, composition and manageability. Evolution in the sense that if there are upgrades and modifications, so I can use that to evolve or make the system better. Composition is whether you can add on a feature, add on a hardware component or a software component and whether you can manage the overall system. So, for example, if I have a battery power device and I really can have the battery state measured and communicate over a network to a service station, then what I am having? I am having a better manageability of the system because I can replace the battery before the total outage takes place. Next question is that for a given system, how do you specify the reliability? So, we have understood the basic facets. So, let us see how this specification can be done. Reliability requirements are only really expressed in a quantitative verifiable way, but we need to specify them. To verify reliability metrics, an operational profile must be specified as part of the test plan. And reliability is dynamic, reliability specifications related to the source code are meaningless because this is why it is meaningless because you have to look at the reliability of the code in the context of the hardware on which it is running. Okay. It cannot be specified independent of the complete hardware because we are talking about now the reliability of the system as a whole in a dynamic work environment. And these reliability specifications can come from or is specified with respect to different failure classes. What are the different failure classes? Transient occurs only with certain inputs and it can change. Permanent occurs with all inputs. Then recoverable, system can recover without operator in intervention, unrecoverable, operator intervention needed to recover from failure. Then there can be non-corrupting, failure does not corrupt system state or data and corrupting, failure corrupt system state or data. Okay. Now, these are the different failure classes and if you are talking about a reliability specification, you might like to specify reliability specification with respect to failures belonging to these different classes depending on the appliance that you are considering. So, for each subsystem, analyze consequences of possible system failures. From the system failure analysis, partition failures into appropriate classes. For each failure class identified, set out the reliability metric using an appropriate metric. Different metrics may be used for different reliability requirements. So, this is the whole process of specifying reliability with respect to a design. We have looked at what? We have looked at so far functional requirements, non-functional requirements. Now, we are looking at reliability specification for the purpose of designing a dependable system, a reliable system. Take an example. How do you specify that? Say bank auto teller system. So, each machine is in a network is used say 300 times a day. Bank has 1000 machines 
lifetime of software release is two years that is every two years software gets upgraded each machine handles about 200,000 transactions and about 300,000 database transactions in total per day now we are considering what the overall system I have got ATM machines ATM machines connected via network okay now obviously I cannot talk about reliability of a single ATM machine without considering the network with which it is connected because a failure is not only because of the failure of the system but failure of the server as well as network communication so that's why when we are talking about reliability specification of bank auto teller system we have to take the whole system perspective in mind and specify them so what are the different failure classes you are likely to encounter one is a permanent non corrupting here the system fails to operate with any card which is input okay software must be restarted to correct failure that means it doesn't work with any input so this is a kind it's not a transient failure it's a permanent failure and a permanent failure can be non corrupting okay that means the data is not destroyed because data is stored at at maybe a server data is not destroyed but ATM machine doesn't work and what is the reliability metric so you will be specify this ROCOF okay which is related to the failures and not related to transactions so one occurrence per thousand days this could be a specification then there could be transient non corrupting failures the magnetic strip data cannot be read on an undamaged card which is input okay fine so this error can come when you are actually putting the card and asking for a transaction so the measure which is being used is POFOD that is on demand service failure so one in 1000 transactions and this may be a transient again a non corrupting fault and transient corrupting there could be these failures a pattern of transactions across the network causes database corruption this is a dangerous kind of a fault okay a pattern of transactions which is taking place so this error cannot be unquantified so I say unquantifiable should never happen in the lifetime of the system because what does therefore it means that once you have that specification it means that your system must be tested and the software as well as hardware measures should be in place to eliminate this error completely okay which is not strictly true for other two cases because the consequence of this failure is not catastrophic okay but obviously you wouldn't like won't like your this failure to occur five times each day okay so then your customers will run away from the bank so there that's why I need to have proper reliability metrics specified for this case so how do you approach reliability use reliable tools use reliable hardware program carefully and test thoroughly now testing in terms of uh, say software or hardware would have slightly different implications when we are really looking at reliability when we had discussed testing in the last class we just concentrated on functional testing whether it is meeting the functional requirements and also we had talked about some of the performance measures but when we are talking about reliability obviously the correctness and the functional specification is an issue but there are other issues as well we say that reliability improvement how it can happen in a software because we have found that software is a critical component for a reliability failure in many cases we say that reliability is improved when software faults which occur in most frequently used parts of the software are removed okay so removing certain x percent of software faults will not necessarily lead to an x percent reliability improvement why because it depends on what is the probability with which this part of the software is being used okay so it's found that in a study removing 60 percent of the software defects actually led to only three percent of reliability improvement because there are still bugs in the software which are part of the commonly used components and therefore removing faults with serious consequences is the most important objective for this test purpose so you do what is called statistical testing the statistical testing 
for software is primarily the objective is for reliability rather than fault detection. So, test data selection should follow the predicted usage profile of the software. I gave an example of your uh, word processor program. So, there is a certain usage profile which says that thesaurus will be less used. So, you try to have in therefore, more test data corresponding to the more widely used aspects of the software. And measuring the number of errors allow the reliability of software to be predicted. An acceptable level of reliability should be specified and the software tested and amended until that level of reliability is reached. Because you cannot remove possibly all bugs. Okay? And depending on the user profile, you have a test data selection and with respect to the test data, try to figure out what is the kind of errors you are really encountering, whether that is acceptable or not. So, therefore, what is the te statistical testing procedure? Determine the operational profile of the software. In fact, how do you characterize operational profile of the software? If you remember in the last class, we said in a clear box testing, there would be various parts in the software which needed to be tested. Now, parts would be associated with different probabilities depending on the usage profile of the software. So, depending on the probability, I shall select the test data to test out the system. So, apply test measuring amount of execution time between each failure. After statistically valid number of tests have been executed, now reliability can be measured. So, I need to have therefore, substantially or sufficiently large number of test inputs to make a kind of a statistical estimate. Next, we come to the point of safety. Absence of catastrophic consequences on the users or environment is what it guarantees safety. The question is are commercial aircraft safe? They crash very occasionally and the question is how many crashes are too many. Are cars safe? They crash quite a lot. Okay? So, the, all these are issues because related to safety. Okay? So, what we say risk is the expected loss per unit time and risk is formally defined as probability of accident into cost of accident and safety of a system is expressed as an acceptable level of loss. That means, the aircrafts will definitely crash, we cannot avoid it, but whether it is acceptable or not. Okay? So, safety is expressed as an acceptable level of loss and risk is measured in this way. So, if we now compare reliability versus availability versus safety, what we get, they are definitely not same and it is an example. A system that is turned off is not very reliable, is not very available, but it is probably very safe. Okay? In practice, safety often involves specific intervention. That means, that is option or the scope has to be built in. And there are a number of safety critical systems. A system is said to be safety critical if a failure can cause loss of life or severe injury. In fact, all these are examples of your embedded system hardware and software. Okay? Nuclear power plant, braking systems in cars, avionics, train signal systems, dam control systems. All these are examples of embedded applications okay? and control related applications where the safety becomes a key component. Okay? and the design should take care of the safety as an issue. So, in order to do this safety analysis, we need to do what is called risk and dependability analysis. Risk of damages cannot be reduced to 0 and for every damage, there is a severity and a probability and we have to use a technique to find out if a fault occurs, what would be the final risk that is involved and depending on that, we have to take measures to eliminate those faults. The most com more common technique is what is called fault tree analysis. FT is a top down method of analyzing risk. Analyzing starts with possible damage, tries to come up with possible scenarios that can lead to that damage and it typically uses a graphical representation of possible damage including basically and or gates. OR gates are used if a single event could result in a hazard and gates are used when several events or conditions are required for that hazard to exist. Take an example. We are talking about an OS hazard okay? 
and what we have provided here the different faults which can actually lead to this OS hazard and this AND gate means what that floppy includes boot virus boot sequence checks floppy floppy in drive at boot time if all these conditions are true then only the virus can cause an OS hazard this is an OR gate which has been represented here can cause an OS hazard so if I want to minimize the OS hazard because if OS hazard has got high risk I would stop or eliminate maybe floppy drive from my computer system okay so that is exactly what we say when you say that a fault tree analysis or a dependability analysis of a system because if I want to make system more dependable I need to do after I have done the design this dependability analysis try to figure out the factors affecting the dependability of the system and minimize the faults related to those factors or eliminate the sources of those faults okay so this is an example which is very commonly known to you the faults that you really encounter when you are using a PC on a network and how to eliminate the possibilities of these faults and increase the dependability of a system now the fault tree method if you see we are using AND and OR gates and the assumption is there are no dependencies between these two faults if there are dependencies between these two faults or conditions then I cannot really use this AND gate or an OR gate based analysis this is in a way if you are familiar with the concept of AND or graph I am representing the whole system scenario through what is called AND or graph and I am propagating through the AND or graph the effect of a particular fault that is from this is a leaf node and from there I am trying to find out what is its impact on the overall system because OS hazard can get into other gates okay other nodes leading to the root node which will be the system as a whole. So what are the limitations a simple and or gates cannot model all situations cannot model if shared resources of some limited amount like energy or storage locations exist linking up to faults or linking up to factors and there are algorithms making use of Markovian models that are used to deal with such cases we shall not be going into those algorithms it's just trying to make you conscious about that this kind of analysis is important for designing dependable systems the other thing is failure mode and effect analysis this starts at the components level and builds up the whole system starting from the components so starts at the components and tries to estimate the reliability the first step is to create a table containing components possible faults probability of faults and consequences on the system behavior okay using this information the reliability of the system is computed from the reliability of its part, parts corresponding to bottom up analysis so take for example if this is a processor if there is a, a failure of the processor consequence is no service and the probability is 10 to the power minus 6 per hour and and uh, it is critical or not it is definitely critical the whole system will fail so basically what we are telling is I have got a system I have got the components with respect to each components I can have the possible faults of the components probability of the faults that can occur and what is the consequence on the system behavior and combining them together I can compute the reliability of the system okay obviously this can happen once we have done the design then comes the issues of security confidentiality is absence of unauthorized disclosure of information integrity is absence of improper system state alterations okay and things put together is what we get security combination of integrity confidentiality and availability is what defines security of a system under different circumstances these attributes are more or less important denial of service is an availability issue and denial of service can happen because of breach in security and exposure of information is a confidentiality issue so what are the security requirements in a today embedded system which is expected to be connected over the network one is user identification now it is not that all these things would be applicable for everybody but these are the in general requirements 
user identification, secure network access, service access if authorized, secure communication, confidentiality and integrity of the communicated data, then storage, the data stored should not be uh, disturbed, then question of content security, that is usage restrictions of digital content stored, question is availability, can perform its intended function and service legitimate users at all times. So, all these are different aspects of security requirements, okay. Network access, communication, storage, content security, that is the data which is currently stored as well as the availability. Let us take an example of a cell phone, which is an embedded system. Now, there are variety of requirements. From end user's perspective, you would like privacy and integrity of personal data. You would like that no fraudulent calls and transactions are made, okay and you would like the secure execution of downloaded software, you should not have a cell phone virus disturbing the whole system. Then from a content provider, content security and digital rights management. So, it is not that you should download a picture, modify the picture and start selling that picture as a backdrop in a cell phone screen. Then application service provider should provide secure end to end communications. Service provider should provide secure network access. Handset manufacturers should, should have its software and firmware secured against copying, that is intellectual property protection. So, these are security requirements and security requirements coming at multiple levels and that is what is to be appreciated. Because it is just not with respect to the device alone, it is with respect to the different services that is being the device used for. So, what are the challenges? Because computational demands for security processing are substantial. Because if you are actually to implement any kind of coding scheme, computational requirements will be high. Your energy consumptions will be high and there is a need for flexibility. Because if you see, there are security requirements at multiple levels, at a service provider levels, at manufacturers level, at, at the level of actually user, end user. So, at various levels, there is a necessity for security and there is a need for therefore, flexibility in the security algorithms being implemented in embedded systems. And it should be also tamper resistance, protection against attacks of malicious software. So, what it implies? It implies that since you are using limited processing power and limited battery, you need to develop special architectures for this kind of security requirements. So, there are a variety of architecture options. First generation architecture is you implement the security algorithm on the basic embedded processor itself. It is flexible, but less efficient. Second generation is offload crypto function to crypto hardware. Crypto, crypto function is basically for encoding the data, securing the data. So, here you, you start using special hardware. It is high efficiency, but poor flexibility, okay, because you can use hardware with dedicated crypto algorithm. The other option is you offload to programmable engines, high efficiency, high flexibility and first turnaround time. That means, you may have an FPGA kind of a thing implementing the crypto algorithm. So, that gives you flexibility. That gives you something else as well. It is harder to probe than ROM devices because the algorithm gets implemented in the hardware itself. So, by somebody cannot really crack into your encoding scheme by looking at the code stored in ROM and you get increased performance. And also there are cryptographic coprocessors which has come in from a variety of vendors. In fact, OMAP also has got a version with cryptographic hardware built into the system to provide this kind of security to appliances like cell phone. The last feature that we shall look at is fault tolerance, because fault tolerance also increases reliability by including redundancies. And, uh, in fact, software fault tolerance is the ability for the software to detect and recover from a fault that is happening or has already happened in either the software or hardware in the system in which the software is running in order to provide service in accordance with specifications. So, when you are talking about software fault tolerance, it is not always redundancy. When you are talking about hardware fault tolerance, in most of the cases, you are actually putting in redundancies and this is again important for safety critical systems. So, how you go for fault tolerance, very simply, these are the basic issues, what we call design diversity. Okay? You design in such a way that you have 
a diversity built into the system. First is a recovery block based approach. The system operates with, with an adjudicator which confirms the result of various implementations of the same algorithm. There can be multiple implementations of the same algorithm on multiple hardwares and an adjudicator basically decides what is to be done next depending on the output of multiple algorithms. Related to this is n version methods. So, these are all redundancies. There are multiple implementations. In an n version method, you really do not have an adjudicator, but what you have? You use voting. Depending on the majority operation suggestion, you actually take a step. In fact, your uh, all your uh, space shuttles and space operations, the ground control of the space shuttles, all of these really use some kind of fault tolerance systems okay, with n versioning and uh, with multiple systems doing the same job using adjudicator or a voting pattern to make the system completely fail safe. There is also you can use self checking software, self checking software have extra checks often including some amount of checkpointing and rollback recovery methods. If it detects that there is a failure, it would roll back certain actions. Okay? So, that means it keeps track of what it is doing and that is to make the system fault tolerant on a safety critical system. So, it, would want, it, will, it has the ability to roll back. Okay? The ability to roll back is important because otherwise this action may lead to some permanent failures. So, today therefore, we had an introduction to different aspects of dependable design and dependability is a critical issue for deployment of embedded systems. And in fact, today if we look at some of the challenges of embedded system design, dependable design is one of the biggest challenge today for designing embedded systems. Many of the other design issues have reached a certain level of maturity. Dependable design is the one of the issues which is most challenging in this world of uh, networked embedded appliances. Thank you.